Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the webinar this afternoon. My name is Jamie Midas, and I am I am a professor in the Rehabilitation Counseling Program here at Hofstra University. I'm um, going to be talking today about looking at work readiness through a new lens using the stages of change model. Um, this is going to tie in with specifically uh, disability and the world of work. And so I want to welcome you um, and your interest in this topic today. Before we get started, though, I recognize that some of you may be very familiar with the field of rehabilitation counseling. And yet some of you may know very little. So to give some context for the presentation, I want to just give you a quick overview of the field of rehab counseling. Essentially, um, we are a profession where we assist people with disabilities. And it can be any kind of disability, whether it's a person with a physical disability, like a spinal cord injury, to someone with mental health issues, like depression, to sensory, uh, like deafness and blindness, or even you know cognitive disabilities. Um, such as a traumatic brain injury or learning disabilities. And our overall mission is to essentially help those folks achieve independent living and quality of life. One of the ways in which we strive to do that is uh, this emphasis on vocational rehabilitation, where we work with individuals who have disabilities to accomplish their career vocational um, types of goals so that they can, in fact, be a part of the world of work and have access to the same things that people without disabilities uh, have. So today we're going to talk a bit about that in relationship to um, what impacts on their ability to work. And we know that there's a lot of barriers that they face in trying to make their way towards that independence and that world of work. Um, and there's a lot of different models that have been examined in terms of how to help people with disabilities, of which one is the stages of change. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk in general about the model first, and then I'm going to go ahead and talk more directly related to work readiness um, for people with disabilities and how this model might be useful in helping with that. Okay, so and one other thing to just point out to you is today's um, presentation, I actually have more slides than we will have time to talk about. Um, so I'm going to be jumping forward ahead to various slides that are relevant for the time we have here. But I want to let you know that um, in the near future, we will be posting this webinar on Hofstra's homepage, specifically under the Rehabilitation Counseling uh, site. And I would welcome you to please visit that site where you can um, actually print out the entire PowerPoint and look at your leisure. OK, so moving forward, what is the stages of change? Essentially, this was a model that was developed by Prochaska and Di Clemente. Um, and what they were looking to do is to understand motivation of our clients and how we can help clients change their behavior. So essentially, the model is developmental. And it's also sequential, meaning that there's stages to it. And the idea is that clients will move from one stage to another as they're becoming ready, eventually actually being ready, to change or modify uh, some type of a behavior from a behavior that in, in the past hasn't necessarily been working for them towards something that will be more beneficial to them. And the model at present is identified as having five stages, although sometimes you'll see in the field um, it's spoken about in terms of four stages or three stages. And it's also considered to be very process oriented in such that there, there are um, processes that take place within each of the stages that impact on whether or not the client will actually be able to move forward. Um, what's more important to know about this model, however, is the matching of the services to the stage of readiness. And one of the, the things we talk about in real counseling is that sometimes, especially when we're working with clients on their, their employment and career goals, we might be providing an intervention that doesn't really match to where they are at at presently. And so if you have this mismatch and this discrepancy where we have a client that's not yet ready to pursue employment, but yet we're actively 
providing uh, services in that direction, you can run into some roadblocks that can lead to failure down the road. So how do we prevent that from happening? And so this model really attempts to identify the stages, but furthermore, what interventions are appropriate given the stage at which the client is in. And the other thing that's important to mention, and I'll, highlight, I'll move forward um, for a second. Um, just give me one second here to move forward. We seem to have a technical difficulty, so just give me one second. All right, just jumping ahead for a second here. Um, from this slide, what you can see is that the model is presented in a linear fashion and such that a person would move from pre-contemplation to contemplation and so on. But in fact, it's considered to be um, more nonlinear and cyclical. So a client can move forward, but at the same time, they can possibly recycle or relapse to go backwards and then kind of starting over again in terms of moving forward. So I just wanted to highlight that for you. Um, on this slide here before you now, this is just simply showing you how the model model's been used in a variety of other capacities um, in the field. And there's been a lot of research to really validate this measure to say that, that it, these stages do, in fact, exist. Um, and hold on one second. I seem to have a, a question. Oh, okay, no question at this point. Um, but as you can see, it's been used from everything from smoking cessation, changing that particular behavior all the way into substance abuse and so on. And over and over again, these different stages have been proven to exist when we are attempting to change the behavior. All right, so what are the stages? Well, essentially, like I said, we have five stages, and we're going to speak about each of them very briefly. Um, on this slide, you can see we have pre-contemplation to contemplation, preparation, action, and maintenance. And on there, of course, I have the recycling, again, indicating that the person can move back and forth. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to hop forward. Um, the next several slides go one by one through the stages, um, but I do have a slide that sort of captures it all on one. So I'm going to hop forward to that particular slide, and then as I said, when this PowerPoint is posted online, I invite you to please print it out um, so that I can then or you can go back and look more closely at each of the particular stages. And bear with us again as we have a, a few minor technical difficulties. Okay. Okay. So on the present slide, goal for each stage. So what is pre-contemplation? I mean, essentially what this is, is this is the person who we would identify as being in, in denial with respect to understanding that there may need to be a change of, of behavior. Um, Oftentimes when you're talking with this person about potential change, they may appear as being somewhat resistant. Uh, they may, in fact, get somewhat angry as they're talking to you. And oftentimes what you'll find is that there may be family members or friends, even coworkers or such, that where they are expressing concern they have about their loved one in relationship to this behavior that contradicts how the client, him or herself, sees it. So they really have no idea or very little. It would, it would be under awareness or unaware at all um, regarding the need for change. So your goal, of course, in this stage is really to try and work towards heightening that awareness um, through, of course, your counseling technique and such. In the contemplation stage, these individuals do have the awareness. However, they are very much in a state of weighing the pros and the cons, maintaining the behavior as it is at present, to actually doing something differently that could be of benefit to them. And although they recognize that they may need to change, um, they there may be various factors that keep them from being able to do it. So if you look, for example, at the person who may smoke, um, the person may say, I know I need to stop smoking and that it's probably not good for my health and for you know, my lungs and my heart. However, it relaxes me. And so you can see they're seeing benefit to continuing with the, the behavior as opposed to um, eliminating that. 
In the case of preparation, these individuals are now very seriously looking at ways that they might be able to change behavior. So they're, no, they're still contemplating in some respects, but they're beginning to put a plan of action together in terms of who, what, where, when, why. Um, the way that they're going to go about changing their behavior. And so now what you see is they're beginning to put more stock on the benefit of changing as opposed to remaining uh, with the old behavior. And they're oftentimes less resistant and that anger that you might have seen early on has dissipated by um, this point in time. They can even in this phase begin to do some testing of the waters. Uh, so if, for example, if we use the smoking again, uh, it might be that on a particular weekend, the person decides I'm going to cut back to half a pack from my two packs a day just to kind of see how it goes. Um, and then, you know, uh, go back, uh, sorry about that, everyone. Um, and then, you know, go back to finishing off their planning to, to move towards action. And in the action stage, this is when the person is now fully invested and they're, they're implementing the plan as they had worked it out, hopefully with their counselor, and trying to eliminate that behavior. Um, oftentimes they may do it in a step-by-step -step process, um, you know, little steps at a time as opposed to, as we say, cold turkey, um, in an effort to, to move towards permanent permanent change of behavior, but it is possible for them obviously to, to relapse uh, as well during this particular time. And in the maintenance phase, this is the individual who's been at it for quite some time now, and they've really learned how to manage uh, the new behavior. They've got their supports in place. They know how to reinforce uh, themselves to maintain the new behavior. It doesn't mean that they're completely free of potential of relapse or um, slipping back, but they have a much better handle on it than they did, say, the, when they were in the action phase or the preparation phase. And perhaps perhaps an example of this might be for the person smoking, maybe when they were in the action phase, they needed to stay clear of any kind of, say, bar that other people might be smoking in because that might serve as a trigger for them to go back smoking again, whereas in the maintenance phase, because they now have it much more under control, they can begin to sort of reintegrate into that without that serving as a significant trigger to them. Okay, so now let's talk about it and its relevance to work readiness for people with disabilities. Um, as I said, employment and being successful in the work world can oftentimes um, have a lot of barriers for people with disabilities in accessing that and being able to achieve the same level of success as perhaps someone without a disability. Not necessarily always, but there definitely can be challenges. And in our field, we are constantly trying to investigate how we can get rid of those barriers. One of the issues we have is that for people with disabilities, the unemployment rate for people with disabilities, for every 100 people you have with disabilities, about 66 of them are not working. That's 66 percent, which is extremely high. And so we're constantly doing research to try and figure out how can we get that number down and help these individuals to be able to have the same experience um, as everybody else. And so research certainly has looked at a number of ways to eliminate some of these barriers. And in particular, the stages of change has been looked at as far as the work readiness of someone with a disability, looking at motivation uh, to be able to work. And what I'd like to do now is to actually highlight some studies that have been out there and talk about their application to the practitioner working in the field. One thing to keep in mind is that these barriers can come in two ways with regard to employment. It can be something perhaps about the individual in the way that they perceive themselves. Perhaps they've been in the disability role for a very long time, and so the idea of seeing themselves in a worker role um, is very new and uh, scary to them. It might be that they've been accustomed to being on Social Security disability and the idea of getting off that and going to work is scary because they may have concerns, well, what if I have a relapse with my disability and I have to go back on Social Security? Will I be able to do that? There's a number of factors that can weigh in on a personal level for that individual that may 
work sort of against them being motivated about working. The other side of this has to do with employers who uh, provide the access to the employment world. And so we're going to talk about that piece very briefly uh, at the end. But let's talk about the client for now. Essentially, there's a gentleman by the name of Chow Lam who, uh, with his group of researchers has created a tool. And the idea of this tool is that we as RIA professionals can use it when we're meeting with our clients and trying to assess their level of readiness to be fully engaged in the uh, rehab process as it relates to employment and pursuing vocational goals. And this tool that he calls the laser. And essentially, the two studies I have before you are in 2010 and 2007. The first study actually looked at a group of individuals who are on welfare to work. And many of these individuals also had disabilities, um, predominantly mental health. In the other study, which was done in Hong Kong, they, these were clients that were in a return to work program, pain management program, and they were more geared towards having physical disabilities, although some also having mental health tagged on uh, to that as well. And what they essentially did is they created this tool uh, using the stages of change. They created several items that would look at three of the stages, pre-contemplation, contemplation, and action. And the idea was to see if the measure, first of all, could have good validity to measure those three particular stages. But furthermore, what they found is that uh, based on giving these assessment tools to these clients, they could actually cluster them into one of those three groups. So first of all, they found that, yes, the items we put into, these measure, or into this measure will, in fact, measure pre-contemplation, contemplation, and action. And furthermore, we can take how people scored and say they are a pre-contemplator, they are a contemplator, and they are a person in action. So we can identify where they are when we begin to work with them. In the 2007 study as well as the 2010 study, they also looked at outcome. So in the uh, Welfare to Work program, they actually followed these folks six months after they were done with the program. And similarly, in the 2007 study in Hong Kong, they followed them for a period of time after they left the Return to Work program. And in both situations, what they found is that the people who were identified as being in action were the ones that had the most successful employment outcomes in terms of being being able to work, actually working, as opposed to pre-contemplators who are more often than not still unemployed. So this really speaks a lot in terms of what we are doing in the field as far as being able to identify and predict which of our clients might have more success to which of our clients might have less success. And then furthermore, how do we put proper intervention in place to assist them um, in moving from pre-contemplation to action. So in the other study I want to mention, this was done out of Canada. And like the Welfare to Work study, it was done with a population of people who were unemployed. And also many of them had disabilities, primarily mental health again. And what they did is they actually looked at the intervention piece. They took a group of their clients and they put them in a control group and said, hey, you're going to get just the standard services we always provide. And then they took another group of uh, clients that they worked with, and they said, we're going to give you enhanced services, and you're going to be identified in terms of what stage of change you're in, and we're going to have you participate in these workshops around stages of change. And they also added in motivational interviewing, which is a big trend in the field right now. And Similarly, what they found when they matched the services, the interventions, and so forth, is that those individuals in the experimental group had more successful employment outcome than the people in the control group. So it's telling us that, you know, we are seeing evidence that says when you identify where the person's at and then you put intervention in place that matches where they're at, you're probably going to see better outcome in the end. Now, the research is still still very new in this area, and so there's not a lot of it out there, and we really need to do a lot more to build that, but I believe that this is something that will become an evidence-based practice for the field of rehab counseling. One other final note I just want to mention to you in thinking about
about future research and practice is the application of this model for employers. We've been talking about clients, but as most of us who are in the field of rehab know, we are working very closely with employers all the time to change their mindsets about hiring people with disabilities and creating that access to employment and understanding that they can, in fact, fit into the work world. So, and as we know, we run into a lot of barriers with that sometimes, whether the employer uh, simply doesn't have the knowledge about hiring someone with a disability or perhaps there's a fear that if I hire this person, will they be reliable and dependable? Um, what if they, you know, the disability prevents them from showing up to work. We deal with that all the time. Could we not in some way take the stages of change like we have with the laser and clients and adapt and create a tool that we can use as part of our job development activities with employers and have a way to assess their readiness to hire people with disabilities. And certainly we would know if they're an employer who's action-oriented the way we negotiate with them is going to be very different and probably less intensive than the way that we would negotiate with the employer we identify as being a pre-contemplator. I think this is another area that we could absolutely be building and expanding on to try and break down that barrier uh, with respect to employers. So, so that's the presentation in a nutshell, and I do want to entertain any questions um, that you might have for me at this time. Okay, I seem to have two questions. Um, first is, what types of questions does the laser actually ask? Um, I know that the questions steer around specifically um, if they are interested in working, if they feel that they have um, the tools to be able to work. So for example, do they know how to interview? Um, and looking at really um, their belief in themselves and being able to participate in um, interviewing and searching for work, um, seeing themselves in a worker role, those sorts of things. Um, I have given you part of the citation in the presentation. You can actually access um, the article that has the entire tool in it and see the items very specifically there as well. And we will be giving the entire um, citation when we post the PowerPoint up online. The second question, how can employers learn more about job development for people with disabilities? Well, you know, clearly that again um, comes down to the rehabilitation counseling profession um, and the professionals working in the field to actually reach out and connect to employers and have opportunity to be able to present to them and talk with them about hiring people with disabilities. Um, Oftentimes, one thing we try and do in the field is we will utilize employers who um, are more open towards hiring people with disabilities and have them proceed to talk with employers who might seem like they're less open towards hiring with disabilities to be able to address you know, some of those concerns that the employer who, again, if we put it in the stages of change language, is more like the pre-contemplator. If they're talking with an employer who's more action-oriented through facilitation of the rehabilitation counselor, that can sometimes segue and create opportunity that you didn't have before. But we absolutely have more work to do there as well. Um, who is doing research on um, stages of change and employers? Uh, from what I saw, no one is doing it at this time, and that is actually something I am interested myself in pursuing as I've been investigating this area. Most of it's really been more geared towards the client. So um, I can tell you there has been related work done with Dave Vander Vandergoot, Christy Golden, and Dennis Gilbride who looked at another related kind of tool called the Employer Openness Survey. And this tool, it doesn't really look at it in terms of stages of change, but it looks at it in terms of the employer's openness towards hiring with uh, people with disabilities without ever asking them if they want to hire someone with a disability. And the way that they do it is they ask more about the policies of the company. Do they have open door policies? What's their family leave policy? Um, and what they found is that employers that are generally more open about their human resource policies are also employers who are more open towards hiring people with disabilities. So that's a tool that does exist um, that I think was uh, came out in about 2007. Are there any other questions? 
Well, I want to thank you again for uh, taking time out of your day to join us. And again, I encourage you to visit Hofstra's um, you know, website, the Rehab Counseling Program, where, again, this presentation, this webinar will be fully posted. Thank you so much.